Hello and welcome to our latest video looking at some of the untold stories from across Bradley's 175 years. This series of videos highlights just some of the college's interesting stories and tales you may not have heard about that feature in our upcoming anniversary book, Untold Stories. With the new anniversary book containing a college roll of the names of all boys and all staff who will be in the school in this our 175th year, I'm pleased to welcome the college's bursar, Andrew Ashton, along with the author of the Untold Stories book and Radley archivist, Claire Sargent, for this look at Radley by Numbers, where we examine both the changing size of the Radley community and also how Radley has responded to some of the financial challenges it's faced over the years. We start things with a recently uncovered untold story that came to light during the chapel extension work on some of the original chapel building. Claire, perhaps you could tell us what happened. Well, when the foundation stone was opened and uh, we found a little uh, cache of treasures inside it uh, at, the, at, the, at the chapel which recorded the things that were considered most important by the people who were, who were founding the chapel at the time. So this is in 1893. And, and you were there when, um, when the capsule, the time capsule was actually opened. When, what was it like to see what was in that capsule? Yes, I was, Claire. It was, it was a very interesting moment. Uh, as you say, a cache of treasures. And, and one had a sense of history, the fact this hadn't been opened or even come to light for 128 years and our focus has been on uh, the chapel project and extending chapel very much looking forwards not looking backwards so to have a glimpse at the uh, what was what, what happened when chapel was originally built and the foundation stone laid uh, and the fact that our um, predecessors also had an eye to, his, uh, to, to the future and, and then looking back on, on the history of it, because surely they knew we would look at it at some stage. So there's this great sense of excitement uh, as we uh, looked at the capsule and anticipated its opening. It wasn't big enough to uh, clearly have treasure, treasures in a literal sense, although we did wonder if it might have some sort of map showing us where there might be some hidden treasure. Uh, but in many ways, what we opened uh, was far more profound and interesting. Yes, it's, it's one of the questions that, her, that I've been asked since, was that if we were to set up a new cut time capsule, what would we put in it? And so I was really intrigued by what they, actually in 1893, what they did decide to put in it. And I think we've got a photograph of the first uh, thing that was found and opened, which was a, a list of the members of the college at the time, the college role. So a real immediacy about that. that that's, that's absolutely right. And um, in many ways, the danger, I guess, of judging what was put in it now is, is the temptation to say, perhaps that wasn't actually that exciting to have a college role mm. uh, of, of, of names. And, and if we think about what we might put in a capsule in the future, um, clearly in the COVID environment, uh, it would be very tempting to put a lateral flow test in or something like that. Um, but these things are transitionary, whereas names are permanent. And, and so to see a, a school role and of actually who was at Radley in 1893 was very profound. Yes, I, 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 I was struck because uh, one of the reasons for building chapel in 1895 was that the, the school had uh, when the school was founded in 1847, it was renting the land that it stands on uh, and a very small amount of the surrounding parkland. So uh, in 1889, all of that came up for auction. It was a moment where we could actually buy the land we stand on, which is one of the reasons for building the new chapel. So they're really very, very conscious that they're going forward in time at this moment and really want to make a, a record of who they are. Um, so I, I was struck by that and, and the, 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 the possibility from that point of growth in the school because they are not gonna be moved. They, they can say that we're here to stay. We can, we can forward plan. And I could say pretty much that we've been doing that forward planning and the kind of building work that started there with the chapel in 1890. Uh, 1893 laying the foundation stone we've been doing that ever since um, so it really is in some ways a sort of a refounding and, and a restart of the school it's a, it's a very good point i mean there's a real sense of permanence uh the building of the chapel 
the laying of the uh, foundation stone and, and putting the school role, as you say, the, the security of tenure of, of the college land, a real looking forward. And, and back, in, back in those days, the college was you know, less than 50 years old and will have felt young. Um, the college is now coming up to 175 years old. And in many ways, I still feel it is young um, mm. because we're, we're very conscious that we uh, need, to, need to look ahead. We need to protect uh, what we do for generations to come, whilst at any one period of five years, the most important five years for a Radian is the five years they're here. But as, a, as an institution, as, as a body, we, we must plan in perpetuity to protect that forever. Yes, and, and a, a lot of the work that we've been doing at the moment is, is about planning in perpetuity. And it is, is also based on all of the planning that's been done since uh, that, that first acquisition of, of, of the land, that first purchase. I know we had um, in 1930, right at the beginning of, of, the, of the Great Depression, there was panic that the, the whole school was under threat because there was going to be a, a massive expansion of, of building around the outskirts of Abingdon, which would, could very easily impinge and come right up to the edge of the school's land at that moment. It, it owned in 1930 only 180, uh, 160 acres of the parkland. And that was the moment where they, they actually set about setting up the land fund and, and one of our major fundraising moments just to buy the land to protect us and, and to establish what Radley really is, a school in the country. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the importance of land, the importance of what you can do with land. And actually going back to Seal and the founding principles, as you say, a school in the country. So the idea, uh, the word greenbelt, of course, is a very uh, um, topical word. Uh, we, we, we like to think of it in terms of the Radley College Greenbelt, that rural setting, and, and that is something that has been precious to us over many years. And yet, clearly, when you talk about the growth of Abingdon um, and, and, and urban um, development, um, that, that almost could be as if you're talking today, not back in the 1930s. So this is, this is forever something that needs to be managed, indeed, the college itself, um, in managing um, forwards, managing towards the future, it has to make judicious decisions from time to time around the use of its land, but never forgetting uh, the rural setting and the importance of the campus. That, that's one of the tensions that we have at the moment, isn't it? Because obviously the government has a quota for how many houses need to be built across the whole of the Vale of the White Horse, and that impinges on our land. And so we've got quite a lot of uh, construction going on. Uh, are on the outskirts of, um, of, of the college itself. But I, I think one of the points about that is, is, is that the money which is coming from that is going back into the college role, going back into financing bursaries and the number of boys in the school. Is there a sort of an, an optimum number of uh, boys, that, that careful balance between the number of boys we have in the school, the fee income, what we could do, and whether we sort of tip over into being too large or we go to become too small to be viable. Yes, I mean, I think there are, there are sort of various magic numbers here and those magic numbers might evolve. Uh, if you look at the history and, and look at the school role in 1893, look at the school size now, you know, we have generally by and large, possibly with the exception of the two wars, grown year by year, certainly uh, decade by decade. The, the, the pattern has been one of growth. Um, and, and, and there is the danger of reaching a tipping point at any one time. At the moment, um, our view is there's something special about the size of a social, the size of a year group, the size of a year group within a social. Um, a decision to build L social wasn't changing the dynamic of the size of a social or the size of a year group in the social. And indeed, the way uh, we, we managed um, what goes on in the classroom or what goes on in the sports fields was very much planned to protect what we've got and the decision to expand the chapel was to protect what we've got that sense of collegiality so moving from a school of 680 690 to school of 750 760 was a natural iteration because it was planned but that's not to say it's a natural iteration to do it again into the future 
coming back to your question around the financial side of it, there's also uh, what is what is the right number in terms of efficiency, uh, so that one can manage the costs uh, in a, in a in a most efficient way. One can have an eye very importantly on. Uh, the fees, because it, the fees are expensive, because it costs a lot to run um, uh, a, a boarding school uh, and offer the, the proposition that we offer. And we need to have an eye on that. And that also links to funded places uh, and the ability to grow an endowment to support uh, parents uh, who, who cannot afford to pay full fees, where we can offer bursaries uh, and in some cases full fee bursaries. Uh, to, to optimise uh, both the financial shape of the college and, and, and the mix of the intake. Well, this, this is um, a principle that goes right the way back to our founders, of course, because one of, they, one of their ideals was that every 10th place in the school should be fully funded. So we're, we're, we're returning to that. And there have been times when we've tried to do that in the past, but it's always been this, this careful balance between uh, what we can afford by way of, of, of funding, what we have to uh, cover by way of fees. Absolutely, and, and it was a noble vision, one free place in 10, but it was a vision. Uh, we haven't done that, had not done that uh, and, and, and until now. Uh, and now we are very much moving towards that. And of course, it's in, in, in current day terms, it is not as simple as one free place in 10. Uh, the vision is a spread mm. so absolutely there might be 10 percent of the school role on fully funded places uh as as we work towards our vision but at the same time there might be 10 percent of the school role on 50 percent funded places and 10 percent on 20 percent funded places and so forth so we're taking the founders our, our ideals and vision we remain true to those but we hope we are delivering against those in a in a modern day sense and very much what's coming through to me there is, 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 is how we work in partnership with parents. That, that, that although you could say that the parent is our customer, they're also partner in this, in, in what we do, in, in, in funding, in supporting other boys um, through fees and so on. And, I, and when we go right back to the very beginning, uh, there was a, a moment in 1852 where the parents actually took over the school pretty much. Um, because uh, funding wasn't coming, it wasn't growing, but it was being run in a very extravagant way. And, and basically the parents stood up, had a meeting in Westminster and said, we believe in the principles of this school. We want to make it work. And we need to come and, and bring a little bit of common sense, if you like, into all this vision, which, it, which is there. And I know one of the things that you've been very concerned with, with with COVID has been to work in partnership with parents because economically that has affected families right across the board, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And we must never forget, as you say, uh, the importance of our parents as partners, as customers, um, and, and, and indeed their wisdom. As you, as you say, our, our parents come from a wide range of walks of life. We're a school, we're a learning organisation. Um, just as we teach our boys, we can learn from our boys, we can learn from our parents, we can learn from our staff. It is very much uh, an important and symbiotic uh, relationship um, and, 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 and a very important part of that. And as you say, when COVID, when the, when the seriousness of the COVID pandemic became clear, there was a real fright, not just uh, amongst ourselves, but amongst parent body, individual parents were um, having their own hardships and, and issues to manage, just as we ourselves at Radley College were. And there's a real sense of, of collective there in, 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 in terms of, of working together and working through that. At a time when initially none of us quite knew what was going to happen next, who would have thought that the campus would be closed by government decree and we couldn't welcome boys back? To, to the campus. And what does that mean in terms of our ability to function and sustain things? And what does that mean for our parents? And so how we responded to that, um, obviously it wasn't something to be done just in isolation. It was very much to be done through that relationship with boys and with parents uh, in, in terms of re-establishing uh, a virtual Radley, looking at the financial support we could provide, discounting 
the fee after we'd worked out the numbers and worked out how to actually pay the bills. Um, there's a lot of work in a short space of time and everyone raised to that. The success, if you like, of Radley through virtual Radley 1 and 2 and 3, of lockdown 3, has been the success of the whole community working together, not the success of a, of a group of people on the campus. It's been a much wider effort. Mm. Very, very much says you, you never expect to have to live through a, a global crisis and, and to take the school through a global crisis. I mean, we've already talked a little bit about the land fund responding to the Great Depression in, 19, in 1930. And as you say, the, the government threat to the school, we face the same potential uh, in, in World War II with, 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 with a, uh, a suggestion that the school, the whole school could be requisitioned by the government because it's so close to London, but not in a direct line of fire of anywhere else. And, and that was only solved by the, the radical uh, move of bringing Eastbourne College here to live on campus and, and to share all of the facilities. Did you have a sense, I, I know people have been talking about Churchill and the world and, and fighting on the beaches, is, is, has that been your sense as a person? Um, I mean, there's a sense of, of one, one sort of living in the moment during, during a crisis and, and, and a real sense of team. Um, and of people, as I said earlier, people coming together and in, in, in terms of the team at Radley College very rapidly putting together a COBRA team, we're even using governmental language there, a COBRA team to day by day manage the situation and, and, and to bring in a vast array of stakeholders appropriate to the crisis. In the case of COVID, clearly medical input, the lead nurse, uh, uh, the council member uh, with, 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 with the medical uh, background and, and liaison with the college doctor are all really important things in a pandemic. Um, so, so that sense of team and living in the moment uh, was absolutely uh, part and parcel of that. Um, I mean, who'd have thought? I mean, I, I spoke to Common Room, uh, as, as we do periodically, the warden and myself, on, on strategic matters, uh, I think about two years previously, and I was talking about the history of, of the college and everything we'd been through, you know, everything uh, from First World War, Second World War, various economic crises, um, in, including the financial uh, crash of, of, of well, um, the OPEC oil crisis, even in the 70s, financial crash in 2008. We, we, we've stood a lot, even, I even mentioned swine flu, I think, when we thought at the time, swine flu, right, we know how to deal with the pandemic. And then COVID comes along and the rules change. And suddenly you're dealing with a whole new situation, which nobody ever before thought that they would be dealing with. And the, you know, that, that's those wartime metaphors, I think, apply to a degree, um, clearly. Clearly, um, whilst there are many tragic and personal stories around the impact of COVID, um, I think it would be dangerous to, to quite equate that uh, with the deprivations uh, uh, of a whole society at all time. And yet, in other ways, the fact that the campus was closed, that didn't happen in the war. Um, so it was different in every crisis. I think the point is, every crisis is different, however many scenarios you rehearse, you won't rehearse the scenario of the crisis to come and bringing it back to a financial point, having a, a magic number, um, perhaps of school role, having uh, the, the, the land, the bricks and mortar, uh, the financial endowment, all of these things provide the resilience to be able to respond to a crisis and then rebuild from it. Yes. I was, um, I'm always struck by the use of the word role, and I have actually beside me one of the original roles. So if I hold this up for people to see, here it is. This is 1857. So this is under Sewell. It's very fragile. So it is, it just unrolls. And that is why we call it the school role. And there was one of these drawn up every year. Presumably now we would call it the calendar or even school base in the database, but it goes back to this. And the growth that we've seen has been massive. And we opened in August 1847 with three boys, four teachers. And actually a couple of people, um, they were attempting to find a, a butler. They had a matron. There were some uh, servitors, some serving staff, who we don't mention necessarily when we talk about three boys and four teachers. Um, 
but what we're looking at here at the at the end of the book this time is, is to compare that and to include that and that inclusivity of everybody has been a, a, a real thing that has been incredibly important as you say during covid uh, as well is that the whole community works together it it, it it isn't divided into teaching staff and operational staff not talking to each other but working together and so everybody is included this time in the book. So it's going to be a massive number of names. I, I, I think presumably somewhere more than a thousand people. So we've gone from 10, <laughs> 10 to a thousand in 175 years. It, it, it is quite remarkable. And, and I, think, I think that's so important. We talked about it earlier, the importance of the community. Everybody has a role, use that word again, mm -hmm. a role to play. Um, everybody all teaching staff, all operational staff, and that's before all parents, all members of the Radley Village community even, um, they all have a role to play in different ways. Um, ultimately, from our point of view, representing Radley College, it is ultimately about delivering the finest possible education we can. And that's everything from fantastic buildings, outstanding uh, gardens to, to have that aesthetic, have that sense of well-being, the grounds that we play our sport on, it all contributes to the all-round education. Um, teaching, academic teaching, clearly, clearly um, uh, is, is important, but how many lessons in a classroom are there in a 168 hour week? Um, it, it's only a small portion of the whole. Uh, so everything, everything plays a role in this. And I think that excellent summary of where Bradley is today is the perfect place to bring this conversation to a close. My thanks go to both Andrew and Claire for a really interesting look at the college from this slightly different viewpoint. And some of the themes and the stories raised in this talk feature alongside many others in the anniversary book, Untold Stories. This is available to pre-order through our publishing partners at www.profileditions.com forward slash Radley at a special discounted rate of just £30. Thanks very much for watching. <laughs>